Welcome once again to God's house. Ask the Lord's blessing upon you as you worship with us. Um, a few corrections from this morning. Well, at least one correction from this morning. Um, and that is there's two birthdays on April the 6th. Both people in their 90s. <laughs> so, uh, 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 Mr. Margino also uh, has a birthday on the 6th. Uh, he's 93. And so we really... 
uh, ask the Lord's blessing upon him too. So, two pieces of cake on Wednesday, I guess. <laughs> well, let's uh, enter into God's presence with the singing, uh, stand up and hear God's call to worship from Psalm 71. <clears throat> also with the lute, I will praise you and your faithfulness, O my God. To you I will sing with a harp, O Holy One of Israel. My lips shall shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you, and my soul, which you have redeemed. My tongue also shall talk of all your righteousness all day long. For they are confounded, for they are brought to shame, who seek my hurt. People of God, let's worship the Lord with joyful hearts. My strength and help is in the name of the Lord, and He is the one that has created the heavens and the earth. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's worship God in songs. We sing from the Blue Psalter Hymnals, number 112. Now let's confess our holy faith as we recite together the Nicene Creed, which is found on the back of the bulletins. Let us all confess with one heart and one voice. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, Begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. 
whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Evening offering will now be received and it will be for the general fund. And that is going to be for our God with our evening prayers. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, once again we gather around your throne of grace to bring forth from our hearts a gratitude for all that you have done and are doing for us day by day. And our Father in heaven, it never gets old for us to be reminded that we have been given the right to be called the children of God. That we are treated as those that were native born, registered in Zion, and granted that glorious place of being called joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ of your kingdom. Having our sins forgiven, of us being reconciled to you, Hearts that have been set free from condemnation because the sacrifice has been made on our behalf. Not in symbolic form, but in reality. In the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father in heaven, we ask that you would forgive us for those times that we simply take it for granted without entering in to the pain and the suffering that our Lord Jesus Christ underwent for us. And our Father in heaven, we pray that as we worship you and as we meditate on all of the wonderful acts of redemption that have been accomplished, finished uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may shape the way that we live 
the way that we think, the way that we serve you day by day, such that, our Father, we do not moan and groan for the difficulties that we have, the struggles that we face, the challenges that confront us, but rather with the Apostle Paul we might confess from the heart that these slight and momentary afflictions are nothing in comparison to our Lord Jesus Christ and nothing in comparison to what you have bestowed upon us. And so, our Father, we pray that we might truly humble ourselves before you, that we might truly take in with our hearts and minds your grace and your love that has been poured out on undeserving sinners such as we are. And that our Father, we might truly serve you with all of our heart, mind, and strength in this week. And that we might not be ashamed of the gospel, but rather our gratitude may be evidenced in the eagerness uh, with which we share the gospel as you give us opportunities in this week. Our Father in heaven, once again, we bring before you the needs of our world, the struggles that we see all around us, and Lord, the sadness that is in our hearts when we see uh, the way that people think and the way that people behave, and nations too. And just the inhumanity in which they treat one another, not as people that are made in the image of God, but simply as pawns to push around and to, and to destroy for their own well-being. And our Father in heaven, how sad that is. And so our Father, we pray for your wisdom. We pray that you would guide the leaders to see uh, the sinfulness of these acts. And Lord, to stand in defense of those uh, that are being killed and mistreated. And so, Father, we pray for wisdom for the leaders and courage uh, to stand against evil, to restrain evil. And sometimes that falls to nations uh, to stand up and, Lord, to defend uh, those that are being killed. Our Father in heaven, we pray for our own country and we pray for our own leaders that they would give leadership and courage uh, to others to stand firm and, and to stop uh, this evil that is portrayed on our TVs day after day. Our Father in heaven, we pray uh, also that you would be with our country and Lord, it's when we are divided and weak that it seems that that gives a green light for those that uh, plot evil and care nothing for others. And so, Father, we pray that we might stand united as a nation and speak with one voice and, and stand against wickedness. And we have a world in which many areas are destabilized and our Father in heaven, we just pray that you would give us the strength and courage that we need. Our Father, again, we thank you for the love for your people. And we're thankful, Lord, to uh, celebrate and to thank you for uh, Bob Marginot's birthday that is also this week. And the way that you've blessed him with long life and, we ask, and good health. And we ask that you would continue to do so. And uh, Lord, especially in later this year as they move, we pray that you would uh, go before them and uh, provide for them a, a place and a church in which they can continue to uh, fellowship and serve you in the midst of your people. Our Father in heaven, we pray uh, also that you would uh, be with those that face challenges day by day uh, due to health concerns Lord, we just commend them to your care. And we pray that you would continue to provide grace sufficient uh, for all of their needs. 
Uh, Father in heaven, we pray that you would also be with uh, Gary's sister-in-law as she begins chemo treatments. And Lord, we pray that you would be with her family and that you would continue to give good success uh, to the treatments. And uh, Father in heaven, we pray uh, also for uh, Ron Burr, uh, Burr and his parents as they are going to be moved uh, closer uh, to live with him. And Lord, we pray that that transition may, may go well uh, for them too. And just the, the heaviness of heart with which they move, uh, having, having uh, their daughter taken uh, into your wonderful care. Uh, Father in heaven, again, uh, we pray that you would uh, receive our thanks for our churches. We're thankful that we could meet this past week. We're thankful for the uh, business that was conducted, and we pray that it would have been uh, to your honor and glory. And Lord, we just pray that you would be with our churches because uh, we face challenges too. And we just pray for wisdom and strength that we may do what is right in your eyes and that we may care for the flock, and that your people may be um, loved and guided by your word and by your spirit. Our Father in heaven, we pray again that you would hear our prayers as we bring them before you. We pray, Lord, that we might uh, know what it is to, uh, to face the challenges of life, uh, cares that we have, concerns, anxieties that come in our lives, and Lord, that we might know to bring them before you for your wisdom, for your courage, for your strength to be imparted to us, that we might indeed face life's trials in a way that brings honor and glory to your name and in a way that magnifies uh, your salvation and the faith that you give to your people. And so we pray that you would hear our prayers and that you would answer them according to your wonderful grace. And now let us stand and worship God again as we sing from the Psalter Hymnals number 330. Oh, 
You may be seated. Our scripture reading this uh, afternoon is taken from Genesis chapter 22. And reading verses 1 to 19. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar and there placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. So far the reading of God's word. Dear people of God, as we said this morning, uh, as we begin this journey of the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross, not only do we want to know who the Lord Jesus Christ is, so that we can understand better the love of God, Um, and what he has done for us. 
but also the redemptive acts that were going to be accomplished. What it was that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to do. And on whose behalf he was going to do it. So that's why my thoughts turn, as they have on other occasions when we've looked um, at the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, to this passage, because it, it draws us in to these events in a much more personal way. Because the scriptures often impress upon us <clears throat> the love of God in this very way. He who did not spare his only begotten son, but gave him up for us all. Those are easy words to say. But those words ought to take hold of us, hold of our feelings. They ought to grip us so that we truly understand what it is that God has done for us. And God wonderfully provides avenues and examples that we can easily relate to. And so, through Abraham and Isaac's experience, we can enter into those emotions, those feelings, and understand with a little more empathy what it means when it says, God did not spare his only begotten son, but gave him up. And it's important that we do that. We never want to excite people's emotion just for the sake of it. But make no bones about it. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is emotional. It does affect our feelings. It does affect everything about us, when we truly understand what it is that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Now, of course, maybe we haven't gone through the same experience as Abraham of God calling him to sacrifice his son. But all of us, I'm sure, know that painful journey of seeing loved ones coming to the end of their life. And we know what, what pain and struggle we go through of letting go as they draw ever closer to the final day of their life. How, how it affects us. And so, in order to enter in, as I said, to understanding what God did for us. Because in God's um, redemptive acts, it, it's both the feelings of Abraham and Isaac that are being experienced. Because it's not just the Lord Jesus Christ walking to his death, it's the Father leading him there and the Father pouring out the judgment for our sins upon him. So it's both, the Father and the Son. And so, to draw us in, to help us understand, seems to me this passage that is before us is a very useful passage for us to understand. And in fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself related that. Himself brought them back to Abraham. And I believe it's this passage that the Lord Jesus Christ is referring to when he says that Abraham rejoiced to see my day and saw it and was glad. And you think, well, what was the Lord Jesus Christ referring to? What experience did accomplish that for Abraham to see his day, to see Christ's day? And I can't help believing that it is correct that it was this experience of Abraham. Of entering in to what the Lord Jesus Christ was going to do. And that is lay down his life 
for us. And so I trust that we, this passage would enable us to do that. Because where Abraham was directed to go was the land of Moriah on one of the mountains, exactly where the temple is located, where Jerusalem is city out of, outside of which the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins. So how did Abraham see the day of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, first of all, he saw it through experiencing death. Death at the hands of a father. Death of his son by his own hand. God, we're told, tested Abraham by asking him to take his only son. And how, the, how God lays that out, how he um, adds words upon words so that the message gets through. Abraham, I want to take your son. I want you to take your son. Your only son. The son that you love. The one that's dear to your heart. I want you to take him. And I want you to take him and offering, offer him up as a burnt offering. A time to accord into testing. Testing that is not pleasant. And sometimes we wonder what the point is. For Abraham, this was the way that he was led, as I said, to seeing the glorious day of Christ. And he didn't complain. He didn't say, Lord, why did you take me through this? Why, did, why didn't you just explain it in words? Right? Why didn't you just tell me in words? Yeah, Abraham, I could have. But you would not have felt it. You would have not understood it as well as you do now as you go through this experience. Oh no, it left a much deeper impression upon his mind and heart as he walked that path. And he took his son. God stresses, as I said, to Abraham the gravity of what he was asking him that that would show, test his love for God. Do you love me that much? Because that's the love with which I love you. I will not spare my only begotten son. I will give him up for your salvation. I just want you to experience that. So that you will appreciate what it is that I'm going to accomplish for you and for your descendants after you. Abraham was the one that was led, was to lead Isaac. Not just to send his servants to do it, but no, you have to do it. You take your son. You take the wood. You take the fire. You take the knife. No, you do it. so that you yourself can understand what it is that I will do in due time. You just imagine the heartache as Isaac asked about the sacrifice. My father. I mean, we have the wood. We have the fire. Where's the sacrifice? What are we going to sacrifice? You can just imagine the Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. If it be possible for this cup to pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. I mean, isn't that kind of similar. The Lord Jesus Christ knows what's coming. 
And he knows the gravity of what's coming. And yet he submits to his father's will. And Isaac, I mean, he was a young man. I mean, he could figure things out. He was already asking that question. I mean, there was no question in his mind when Abraham built the altar and put the wood and then put him on it and bound him up. There's absolutely no doubt in his mind. He didn't flee. He didn't start shouting at Abraham and saying, you must be crazy. This, this can't possibly be God's will. This cannot possibly be right. No, he trusted his father. And though he couldn't figure, figure it out, nevertheless, he gave in to his father's will. And so in this small way, as I say, Abraham was privileged to enter into and to explore and to get his mind and heart around what God was going to do. And so though he lived many, many years before the Lord Jesus Christ came, the Lord Jesus Christ said, no, Abraham saw my day. Rejoiced to see my day. And saw it. And was glad. Oh, what a what a, a wonderful experience God took him through. Painful, yes, but thrilling as he saw the gospel. And as I say, not only the father's experience related to Abraham, but also the sons, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, through Isaac. And the questions that he asks. And that the Father sent him. But he came willingly. He wasn't forced. As Philippian tells us, the Lord Jesus Christ came to do his Father's will. He emptied himself. There was no forcing. He knew exactly what he was coming for. And yet he was in full agreement with his Father. The Lord Jesus Christ did not open his mouth, but was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Not that he didn't have power to avoid it. Not that he didn't have the right to avoid it. No, he embraced it because of the love that he had and his father had towards sinners such as you and such as me. Of course, any attempts to enter into what God did for us would fall woefully short. We can never duplicate that. The disciples could not follow the Lord Jesus Christ, even though they were determined to do so and ready to give up their lives, but they couldn't. It's not a path that we can take. Or they went so far, but no further. So with the experience of Abraham and Isaac, there was no way that they could go all the way. And not that they knew that, of course, as they were going through it, but God did. And so as Abraham is about to strike Isaac with the knife and offering up as a burnt offering, God intervenes and shouts to him, Abraham, Abraham, don't harm your son. Don't put him to death. Because now I know that you love me. 
with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your strength. And Abraham sees the animal in the thicket and sees it as God's provision for him, as a substitute for Isaac. But Hebrews makes it very clear that in terms of going through those experiences of losing your son, that he did. Figuratively, we're told in Hebrews that he did sacrifice his son. In his mind and heart, he did do it. And so that release of Isaac from being sacrificed was viewed as a resurrection. So Abraham saw and experienced the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, Abraham did not go all the way because he wasn't able to do that. None of us can imitate the love with which God loved us such that he did not spare his only begotten son. That's a love that we cannot, cannot duplicate. It's a love for us to admire. It's a love for us to rejoice in. It's a love for us to experience. But not a love that we can duplicate. But also in this experience, we see, Abraham sees, that that it was going to be through a substitute. And so, as we've said, as he's about to sacrifice his son, and did do so in his heart and in his mind, God intervenes and provides a substitute. It was a substitute that kept him from sacrificing his son. And so God provided a substitute. And he, in fact, named that mountain with that in mind. The Lord will provide. As he had said to his son, not knowing, of course, what was going to happen, but God himself will provide an offering. And God did provide an offering. In the case of Abraham, it came as an animal. In fact, God in the Old Testament reinforced that many, many times. How many sacrifices were offered in the Old Testament? That was God providing a substitute for our atonement. It was symbolic, of course. It could not take away our sins. But nevertheless, it pointed to something greater that was to come. It pointed to something that we could rejoice in. It pointed to something that we could have confidence in. As Abraham said, God himself will provide an offering. Even though we deserve that and we deserve death, yet in God's love, he will provide an offering, a substitute. And when Abraham was ready to do it, God understood. And God, not that God didn't know, but it became evident to Abraham that that love that he had for God was genuine. There's nothing that he would withhold from God. But the amazing thing is that there was nothing God withhold for the sake of Abraham. He would not spare his only begotten son. What joy and relief this brought to Abraham. How their journey back home was dramatically different than the journey to Mount Moriah. Humbled before God. 
No doubt for Abraham and Isaac, it was a moving and a humbling experience. And in it, they caught a glimpse of the day of Christ. God will provide. That's what Abraham rejoiced in. And it was in the day of Christ that that finally got fulfilled. God provided an offering. And who in the world would ever have thought that it would be his son? His only son. The one that he loved. God went on to make promises to Abraham. In fact, We're told God took an oath to bless Abraham and his descendants. But even more, through his seed, the nations would be blessed. God spared Abraham's seed, namely Isaac. But God promised to bless Abraham further through another seed. It is a reference to one particular seed, not to descendants in general. And the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3.16 clarifies that and interprets this reference to seed as a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as in Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that blessing had to do with him becoming the Lamb of God that would suffer our curse such that we would be reconciled to God, which is exactly what Paul is speaking about in three verses before Galatians 3.16, which is Galatians 3.13. Abraham was given to see that God would provide his own beloved son as a sacrifice for sins on behalf of God's covenant people of which Abraham was the father. It wasn't just personal for Abraham. No, it was more than that. It was to to him and to his seed and indeed to the nations of the world. No wonder Abraham rejoiced to see Jesus' day. And when he saw it, when he experienced it, he was glad. And your joy should be the same as Abraham's and Isaac's as they went home alive, joyful, thankful. As we follow this journey to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to come out the other end with rejoicing. Sadness, yes, in terms of the things that we see and hear, but rejoicing just the same. And that rejoicing is through what Abraham experienced, which Hebrews says was a resurrection. That he did figuratively offer up Isaac and received him back from the dead. And that's what we have with the the Lord Jesus Christ. His resurrection. That he laid down his life for us. And how sad we were to, to see that and experience that. And enter into God's sacrifice for us of his father. Taking the life of his son as a payment for sin. How much then should we rejoice at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? Not to say somehow it wasn't as bad as we thought after all he's resurrected. No, no, no. Abraham didn't think that. Abraham and Isaac didn't make, make belittle the experience that they had and the thoughts that they had and the feelings that they had as they came home. Right, everything worked out, so we forget all of that. No, no, they did not forget that. They did not forget those thoughts. Those three days 
as they walked to that death that was coming. They knew the burden that that was. And it's in the light of that that they went home rejoicing. And so with the Lord Jesus Christ, though it ends with the resurrection and this great rejoicing, and we will see that, let us not forget the journey. Let us not forget the pain and the suffering. Let's not forget the tears of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not forget the Father's sacrifice of not withholding his only begotten Son. People of God, this is a most tender journey. A journey that requires great thought us to enter in to the sacrifice that God made for us. And Abraham and Isaac offer us the vehicle with which to enter into that. To love God with all of our heart, strength, and mind. Because he loved us with everything that he had. And we need to love him with everything that we have for the rest of our life and then into all eternity. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we cannot begin to express in words the gratitude of our hearts because we have never been loved that way. And our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you loved us in ways that we could never have imagined. And so, our Father, we humble ourselves before you. And as the Lord Jesus Christ said, we show that gratitude by taking up our cross and following you, serving you. And our Father in heaven, we pray that these thoughts and truths may indeed be in our hearts and minds every day so that we never question our love and service to you. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you would bless our journey as we trace the steps of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father in heaven, we pray that your churches may indeed give due diligence so that our love for you may be fanned into great flames that strengthen us and motivate us to proclaim it to all the world so that they might enter into the joy of Abraham and into our joy at loving and serving you. Our Father, hear our prayers and bless us in these weeks to come. For we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us stand and respond as we sing from the Psalter Hymnals number 375. Oh,
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Thank you.